Hi, it's Nicola Bird here from a littlepeaceofmind.co.uk. I really am pleased that you found your way here to this audio and I really hope it's going to help you a lot. I want to start off this audio um, just telling you a little bit about my, my own story because if you're experiencing anxiety, fear, panic attacks, stress at the moment, and my guess is you probably are or you wouldn't be listening to this audio, um, I just want to share with you my story to show you really that there's hope to show you how far you can come. And so that by the end of this audio, you realise there is a way forward, that it doesn't have to be like this for the whole of your life. My background, my academic background is in psychology. I have a first degree and a master's degree in psychology, and I spent a number of years working in the psychology field. Um, And before moving then into the personal development field, And I've been working in the personal development field for a number of years. I trained as a coach. Um, I've been a trainer. I've been a speaker. I've um, done my NLP practitioner training. And I've been working as a coach and a helper of other people, really, for many, many years. But what also happened was that I also have experienced anxiety and panic attacks um, for the last probably 20 years. And... To the extent, at at its absolute worst, where there was a period where I just couldn't leave the house um, at all. I had to go and seek hospital um, treatment as an outpatient. Um, But I tried everything over the years to help myself to overcome this feeling of anxiety and uh, panic attacks that I was experiencing. So I tried um, cognitive behavioural therapy. I tried uh, relaxation and meditation I tried um, a psychologist, Um, I tried medication, I tried, um, what else did I try, tapping and EFT, I tried neuro-linguistic programming, I tried timeline therapy, Um, I tried a whole host of tools and techniques and strategies to really help myself try and control my anxiety, to get it under control so that it didn't interfere with my everyday life. And I'd have peaks where it seemed to be working and the anxiety would kind of disappear and I'd have months, sometimes even years, where it just wouldn't even show itself at all. And then I would be back into it and I would be experiencing it again. And um, and it just felt like a mire when I was in it. When I was in the middle of it, I wouldn't be able to tell people um, what was going on for me. I would just be making excuses about not going out and not showing up. Um, not being able to drive my kids to school, not being able to um, go more than 20 minutes from my house, you know, all these kind of rules and controls that I put into my play, it put into place during the times I was experiencing that anxiety, um, really so that nobody else would know what I was doing. No one else would know what I was going through. And those of you who've been through this experience will know that when you're in the middle of it, it, feel, it can feel quite shameful and it can feel like a very private experience that you just don't want other people to know about and so you control everything to make sure that other people don't find out about it me I found that when I was the other side of the anxiety when I was feeling okay I was quite happy to explain um, to close friends where I'd been and what had been going on for me but when I was in the middle of it I wouldn't I wouldn't tell a soul at all and then what happened for me is that I came to experience through learning, I was exposed to a very, very different way of understanding the human psychology. And that understanding for me helped move me from trying to manage and control my anxiety to a state where it's just kind of almost like dissolved away. And just through this understanding of how the human psychology works. And that's really what I want to share with you on this audio today so that you can experience some of the huge relief that I have, that this is no longer ruling my life. As I said before, you know, it was turning me into... It felt like it was turning me into a control freak. So I had um, very 
arbitrary defined rules about where I could go and where I was safe and where I wasn't safe and who I could be with and who I couldn't be with and what I had to have with me and what I didn't. So, you know, I mentioned before, I could only go 20 minutes away from my house. Um, I couldn't go anywhere if it was a motorway. I couldn't go anywhere if... um, I was driving and I had my three kids in the car. But if I was driving next to my husband, I was absolutely fine. Um, if I, I always had to have uh, my tablets with me in my pocket before I left the house. I always had to have, <coughs> excuse me, I always had to have my uh, phone with me so that if I got a panic attack or if I was anxious, I could call somebody to come and get me. And I used to do this thing in my head where I would be constantly thinking about, so if I get a panic attack now, who am I going to ask to help me? If I get a panic attack now, what am I going to do? What if I get a panic attack when I get to the supermarket? What am I going to do? If I get a panic attack when I go to the cinema, what am I going to do? And I was constantly playing out these scenarios in my head as to what I would do, who I would reach out to, how I would get help at that point in time. And my whole head was filled with this kind of thinking the whole time. And what happened is my world just contracted and it just got smaller and smaller and smaller. And just before I came to this understanding um, that I'm going to share with you on this call, I remember looking at my life and thinking, you know, I've created this, what, what looks like on the outside, an incredibly successful life. Yeah, I have my dream house. I've got three healthy, beautiful children, wonderful marriage. Um, I've just taken my business up to seven figures. And I looked at my life and I recognized what I'd done in that I had um, created myself a beautiful home so that I didn't have to leave it very often. I had um, created a business, which meant it was an online business, which meant I could sit behind my computer um, pretty much all day at home. Um, and and I just had all the, I realized I had all these rules and it was just constricting and constricting my world and it was turning me into a control freak and my world was just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's that that's really been the difference that I've seen since I've come to this understanding and and that at this point, I want you to hear that and for that to give you hope that that also is a possibility for you, for you to recognize perhaps that you're doing the control freak thing that you might not have realized that you were. And just to get um, to get that feeling of hope that really keeps you listening through the rest of this audio, if nothing else. Okay, I've been there. I know how you feel. I know how crappy it feels. And believe me, it feels very wonderful to be moving through the other side of that. Okay. So one thing just before we get started is that I want you to um, listen to this audio differently than you may have listened to other audios or meditations that you might have listened to. Um, And so what I mean by that is I don't want you to listen for information. I don't want you to listen for instructions. I don't want you to listen to see whether you agree with what I'm saying even and evaluate and intellectually analyze what it is that I'm talking to you about. I just want you to listen, I suppose listen to the, listen for a feeling, listen for the feeling that you get when I'm speaking to you and when we're connecting, even though it's via this audio, I just want you to listen for the feeling because my hope for you is that you just get a glimpse of what I'm talking about here and it's enough for you to want to continue to have this conversation and find out more about this. Okay, so with that in mind, I want to explain to you the basics, I suppose, of this understanding of human psychology and how human beings work that's been so incredibly um, transformative, really, for me and for countless other people around the world as well. And this understanding of how human beings create their own experience is based on the work of a guy called Sidney Banks. Um, And he called his work the three principles. So if this fascinates you, this topic, and it interests you, I strongly recommend that you go and listen listen to, um, go and Google Sidney Banks and either read some of his books or listen to some of his audios. He's an incredible man. And it was his um, kind of epiphany and his insight, his, his real insight into these uh, principles that I'm explaining, going to be explaining to you now, that formed the basis of our understanding of how human beings create their experience. And the first premise I want to start with here is, um, 
sounds very simple. It's that our thinking determines our feelings. Now, all the way through our lives and in our society and 98% of the world and you up until this point all believe that actually things out there in the world control the way that we think and the way that we feel. So for me, motorways made me scared, right? Or um, going more than 20 minutes from my house made me scared. Being in the middle of a cinema where I couldn't get out, being on a train, those things, trains scared me. That was as far as I could see it. And so when you believe that that is the way the world works... So if trains make me scared, well, then it's a really good idea to avoid trains, right? If it looks to me really, really real and true in this world that trains cause me fear, then I'm very, very well advised to avoid trains because they're scary. It makes perfect sense. If you're avoiding the things that scare you, it's because you think that they are scaring you. (laughs) And I'm sure you're nodding your head right now and agreeing that well, yeah, these things do scare me. Like spiders scare me. Going outside scares me. Being in social situations, driving, whatever your thing is um, that I fondly call it gives you the touch of the crazies. You know, that, that's the thing. You think that thing is scaring you. And what I'm, what I'm explaining here is a complete 180 on that. It's actually, it's not the thing that's scaring you. It's your thoughts that are scaring you. Okay, it's your thinking, it's what's going on in your head. It's, for me, it's the idea of what a train is, what it symbolises, what um, being scared of a train means. It's, it's the thinking that I have around a train, for the want of a better example, that's what's causing my feelings. Okay, not the train itself. And if you're having anxious thoughts, you're going to be experiencing anxious feelings, okay? It would never, ever, ever happen that you would be able to have a panic attack or an anxious feeling without having had an anxious thought beforehand. Sometimes I know it really feels that way. When a panic attack seems to come out of the blue or you're walking down the street and suddenly you feel anxious for absolutely no reason whatsoever that you can see, it's because you've had some anxious thinking you may not even be conscious of it, but some anxious, an anxious thought or an insecure thought that's gone through your mind, which has created those anxious feelings for you. And then we experience those feelings and we experience the, um, the sensory effect of those, you know, the sweaty palms, the can't catch your breath, the heart racing, the, um, you know, your legs going trembly and all that kind of stuff that happens as a result of those, those feelings. And, and, it, and it kind of makes the panic and the fear feel even more real to you and even like it really exacerbates it and it makes it feel really real when you're in the middle of a panic attack it feels like a really big horrible scary experience and so this first understanding is really just to start noticing and just to start seeing it everywhere in your life that actually all of your feelings are determined by your thinking And your actual, your whole experience, your reality, your world that you create, you is created around you. Actually, all comes from thought. Okay, human beings, we create our own realities. Now, when I first heard this, this all sounded very woo-woo to me, and it sounded like, well, it looks to me like there's a chair in front of me. Are you telling me there's not a chair in front of me? And I'm saying there is a chair in front of you, right? If I walk up to that chair and bang myself, it's very real that it's there. Um, but my thoughts about that chair will determine how I feel about it. Let me give you a better example. My thoughts about a train will be probably very different from your thoughts about a train. And as a result, the feelings we both have about a train will be very, very different. Now, it could be that the thing that freaks you out, say, for example, you, you experience social anxiety, so going out, um, going out to a bar to meet some people will, will cause you to feel really anxious. Now, I think about that situation, and 
um, I think about it very differently than you do. Now, I might think about it with fear because it's a small, dark space that I can't get out of easily. You might think about it with fear because because um, you have thinking about the fact that there's going to be people there and what are you going to say and how are you going to approach them. It's exactly the same scenario, a group of 10 people standing in a dark bar, but but I'm my thinking has given me a particular type of fear. Your thinking has given you a particular type of fear. My best friend can walk in there and not experience any fear at all because they just don't have the same thinking that we do about that thing. Yeah? So the best way I can suppose is I can bring this to life for you is to think about, you know, what is the thing that it, first of all, what's the thing for you, and there's probably more than one, that feels like that thing scares you? It, it is intrinsically scary to you. And then I just want you to, to start to notice the thinking you have about that thing. And it's the thinking that's scaring you, not the actual thing itself. And you can see that because if you imagine one of your good friends who has no problem with this thing whatsoever, your friend just does not have the same thinking that you do. The same object presents itself, totally different thinking um, and totally different experience about what's going on. Okay. So for me, the next stage in the journey was to think, okay, well, I'm starting to see that it's my thinking that's creating my reality. And I got this on an intellectual level. This, this may be what happens for you. You get a bit of a glimpse of it. You're like, that sounds interesting. And then you start to notice it. And then perhaps on an intellectual level, you get the fact, yeah, I see that. I see that my friend sees the train and has no fear whatsoever and I see the train and I have fear about it and the only difference is our thinking and what for me then was the next kind of where my thinking went after that I suppose was thinking okay so if I have anxious thinking it's going to lead to anxious feelings and if I have negative thinking it's going to lead to negative feelings and if I have happy thoughts It's going to lead to happy feelings. My friend, when she thinks about that bar, tends to have really happy feelings. It's because she's got happy thoughts. Right, I get it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and control my thinking. So I'm going to try and have more of the happy thoughts and less of the negative thoughts. And this is where if you've ever experienced cognitive behavioral therapy or any of the kind of talking therapies, um, in fact, a huge percentage of the kind of um, traditional tools and techniques and strategies used to help with anxiety and panic that you've probably already researched or read about are very much based on this model about trying to control what it is that you think. So it's like write those thoughts down, question them against, uh, measure, like put them up against reality. Are they really true? Like let's really think about what are the thoughts that you're having and, and how can we try and change them? How can we try and change your state so that you approach the bar in a happy, upbeat, confident state rather than a nervous, terrified state? Um, you know, let's try and change the thinking that's behind that. And One of the things that I realized was so important about this understanding, the way human beings create their experience, is that we're not actually, in this, this model that I'm explaining to you, I'm not interested in the content of your thinking. I'm not even interested in the structure of your thinking. Those of you who are NLPers or who have experienced some NLP where it'll be thinking about like, how big is the thought? Where is it? Is it close to you? Is it far away? Like the structure of your thinking. I'm not even concerned with that. What I'm interested in you gaining an understanding of is the nature of thought itself. The fact that we think. The simple fact that we think and those thoughts create our reality, that's the clincher. Just the mere fact that we think and we create the world outside of us. A great analogy that I really makes sense to me about this is um, if you imagine a if you imagine you've got the BBC News on and you've got the ticker tape running along the bottom with the latest news stories flashing up, and that's what your thinking is like. That's what your that's what thought is. Okay, it's the ticker tape. So you'll have thoughts going through your head the whole time. So you'll be thinking. Um, 
shall I have a biscuit now? I must do the washing up now. I hope the kids have gone to sleep okay. Um, must wash the car tomorrow. Oh, I'm a bit anxious about a motorway. Um, I must remember to record EastEnders tomorrow. What, whatever it is, okay, we've got a constant stream of thought that's streaming through the bottom of our, like I always think of it as the bottom, but if you imagine the TV screen, it's just streaming through over and over and over and over and over and over again. And what goes onto that ticker tape is kind of when we're babies and we're born, our... Uh, we're born into this world of thought. Okay, so as soon as we're born, the ticker tape starts going. And the people around us kind of try and write on our ticker tape and try and, um, you know, the adults around us, the, our parents, our caregivers, the environment around us, um, kind of write on the ticker tape, write on the ticker tape. And, you know, this is probably where our thinking that the world, what goes on in the world outside us um, determines our feelings like what's out there determines what's going on in here that's probably where our original um misunderstanding about the whole way the world works comes from at that time so our parents believe that what goes on in the world outside impacts inside very outside in and so that kind of gets embedded on our ticker tape right from a very, very early age. And then from about the age of seven, we start looking outside and we start kind of adding things to our ticker tape from our world and our environment and our friends and the things that are going on around us. And that ticker tape is constantly being added to by our environment and by the movies we watch and the news that we watch and the things that we read and the people we hang out with. Um, and it's just streaming through all, all of the time. But what we're not interested in is what's actually written on that ticker tape, as it were. But just the fact that we are, we are, that the ticker tape is always running. And because that ticker tape is always running and always running and always running, the thought that, the, the thinking that we have around, okay, so, so the ticker tape is running, the thoughts are, the thought is neutral until we, uh, until we jump on a piece of ticker tape and make a big deal out of it. Every thought that we have on that ticker tape is totally neutral. It really is as neutral as, shall I have a biscuit, must get the washing in, oh shit, there's a motorway um are the kids okay um must chop some wood for the fire um oh, my glass of wine is nearly empty i'm just i'm looking around the room for inspiration here um but the thoughts on our ticker tape are totally neutral until the moment that we decide otherwise okay so until the moment that um we decide to kind of jump on board with with a particular thought and engage with it so We'll be having all these neutral thoughts going through our ticker tape, going through our ticker tape, going through our ticker tape. And then all of a sudden, you'll see one that's, um, oh no, there's a, there's, a, there's a train. Okay, so, um, oh, there's a train. Oh, that's the thing that always makes me anxious. Um, best I get in there and control that thought. Um, best I try and um, dampen it down. Maybe I can turn it into a happy thought. Maybe if I do enough affirmations, it'll go happy. Maybe if I just do my 10 deep breaths or my square breathing or whatever it is that you're being taught to do. Um, maybe if I could just push that thought so it's further away. Maybe if I bring it closer. Um, and all we're doing when we're doing that and we're trying to control our thoughts in that way, which is so attractive when we're taught how to do that in terms of managing our anxiety, all we're doing is taking that thought from being a neutral thought and spinning it into a really big deal, which is then ramping up our anxiety. We then, what then tends to happen is that uh, we start to feel worse and then we give ourselves a hard time about feeling anxious. So here we go again. Now I'm feeling really anxious. Why does this always happen to me? I thought I dealt with this. It's never going to be okay. I'm never going to be able to manage to do these things. Oh my goodness, the impact it's having on my kids, on my family. Um, I feel really guilty. I'm so stupid. And you see how we start to add thought onto thought onto thought and like really load it with a whole load of meaning that actually it never really had in the first place. And what this understanding has helped me get much, much closer towards, and I'm not 
for some people, they'll get this insight and it'll just be clear straight away. For some of you, what I want to do is really, it's just that glimpse, that understanding that there's a possibility that this can happen, is that you start to see that the thought really is neutral and that, oh, look, there's a train, is every bit as neutral as my glass of wine is nearly empty. There's no more meaning to it than that. And when you realise that the ticker tape's just going to keep running unless you jump on board any of it, the thought there's a train will pass very quickly and your next thought will come along, oh, I better cross the road now. Uh, My glass of wine is nearly empty. I must pick the kids up from school. And the next thought and the next thought and the next thought, fresh thinking can come through. What we do when we're anxious is we jump on board and we kind of whirl up the anxious thinking and we focus on the anxious thinking which makes us feel worse and then we're you know we're really in a spiral at that stage which can end up in a full bone panic attack but what i wish for you is is for you to get this kind of understanding that if we don't jump on board with it the next thought will come and the next thought will come now i know often i know when i heard this i thought okay I get it. So what I have to do is next time I start to feel anxious or I see the thing that, um, that I think makes me anxious, I'll just not think about it. I'll just not, um, not dwell on it. And I took that as a, as, an, as a prescription, as a tool or a technique or a strategy. It was something that I then tried to do. And this understanding doesn't kind of work that way. It's not something that you have to remember to do or something you have to remember to not do. It's the more you understand these three principles that Sydney Banks has talked about, you will really, really, really start to see that, it, that it's just thought. That's all that it is. It's just thought going through on the ticker tape. And then there is nothing for you to do. These principles, they, they, they're not a guide. They're not a tool. They're not a strategy that you have to implement. They are a way of explaining what's already going on for you okay so there are fundamental principles so whether you believe it or you don't believe it whether you can see it or you don't see it whether you think it applies to somebody else but not to you this principle of thought is operating all the time and what what my realization was um oh my goodness this this is really describing the way the world works it's not telling me to do anything and the deeper my understanding of this the more it looks to me that, that my thoughts are just neutral thoughts, that they're not, they're not necessarily real. Um, and in fact, where we really screw ourselves up is when our thinking looks real to us. When it looks real to me that the train is scary, when it looks real to me that my anxiety is a really big deal, when it looks real to me that there's something I have to do about this, when it looks real to me that this is really important and if I don't sort this out, I'm never going to have my full life, the more real all those thoughts look to me, the more I feel like I have to put strategies and coping mechanisms in place to deal with them. The less, the more I recognise the ticker tape, the more I realise that thought is neutral and it's just spinning through the whole time, the less seriously I take my thinking. And that is the key to freedom with anxiety. It's, t- it's realising that you can take your thinking a whole, lot less, a whole lot less seriously than you're doing right now. Okay, so... One of the other things that I used to do that I explained to you as well is that I used to think all the time, like, what am I going to do if I get anxious right now? What am I going to do if I have a panic attack? Who am I going to call? What am I going to do? I spent way, way, way more time thinking about having a panic attack or thinking about being anxious than I ever did actually being anxious or um, or or having a panic attack, I was making myself anxious about being anxious, like really piling a load of thought on top of the whole experience. And one of the other principles that I want to share with you, we talked about the principle of, of thought, 
there's also a principle of consciousness, which I'm not going to talk that much about on this audio. The second principle, the principle of consciousness, which what consciousness does is it, it makes our thinking look really real to us. Okay, and, and that's what I'm going to explain that one at the moment. But the third one is the principle of mind. And principle of mind is... It's like it's like an energy. If you imagine the TV with the ticker tape going through the bottom, the consciousness is kind of um, the pictures on the screen that are really showing what's going on the ticker tape, right? And they make so they they're kind of like the special effects department. Consciousness will make all the things on the ticker tape look really real and bloody and gory or fun and bright and sunshiny. Their job, like consciousness, job is to make your thought look real. And mind is like the electricity behind the system okay it's the it's the on button it's what gives power to the whole thing like if you didn't have mind you couldn't have any of the rest of it it's an energy it's it's often described as the oneness some people will call it god or the universe or spirit or um but stick with me if this is getting a bit woo woo because one of the things that that mind does for us is it gives us an amazing um, wisdom and guidance and clarity and ability to know exactly what to do in any given moment, if only we can hear it. It's like that small, quiet voice inside that we miss because the ticker tape's always running. The ticker tape is... um, is going faster and faster and faster and faster as we're looking for for ways to control our life and what's going on in our life. And our wisdom is like, it's like a tiny little, I tell you what it is. It's like, you know, you know, when they do the ticker tape and then there's, there's like a little square that comes up and then they start the ticker tape again, or, or there's, you know, there's just a little symbol, just a little thing. That's a little glitch, a glitch in the, in the system. And it's just something a little bit different. Our wisdom is like that. It's like it pops up and, and it pops up and it pops up. But actually it's there all of the time. But we're so caught up in our thinking that it's very hard for us to access it. Like for most people, they don't even know it's there. The way we run our lives is by trying to, con- by trying to control them, by using thought and, and trying to um, control our lives, believing that we're in control. And actually... There is, mind gives us this real, it's kind of like common sense. It's guidance, it's knowing what to do next. And what we find is that once you kind of understand, for me certainly, once I understood that, once I could really see that if I were to have a panic attack... I'd be taken care of. If I were to get anxious, I'd be taken care of. And by taken care of, I don't mean a physical person is going to come up and look after me. What I mean is that wisdom will step in and I'll take the right action at the time. If I'm driving down a motorway and I have a panic attack, wisdom's going to step in and say, pull over to the side of the road, get out of the way, <laughs> right? If I'm having a panic attack, panic attack on the middle of a really busy train, wisdom is going to say to me, you know, get off, get off the train. If you, if you think the train is what's causing the fear, your common sense is going to say, get off the train. And there's a, that common sense that's running all the time. And what I realized is once, once I understood that that was even there and then started to be able to experience it, what I found was my thinking got a whole lot quieter. For a start, as I realized that my, I could take my thoughts a lot less seriously, they kind of slowed down and I had less of a cacophony, run, like the ticker tape slowed down a bit, okay? And there wasn't five lines of it, there was just one line of it. And that was just through realizing that not to take my thinking so seriously. And then when I realized that I had access to this mind, this common sense, what it meant that just fell away from me when I saw it was all the, well, what am I going to do now if I have a panic attack? What am I going to do now if I have a panic attack? Like all that thinking I was doing about preparing and planning, controlling in case I were to have a panic attack or, or feel anxious, like that just kind of melted away all on its own because there was... There was no need for me to be doing it because I, I really saw that this access to wisdom that I, would, that I had would take care of me 
at the point that I needed it. So if I were to have a panic attack, I would know what to do then. So I didn't need to think about it the whole flipping time. I knew that I could trust that I could just think about it if and when it happened. Okay, so for me, there were a whole load of things where my thinking just slowed down and a lot of it just kind of dropped away, which allowed me then to access that wisdom, access mind, access that level of kind of knowing and understanding far more easily and far more often. That kind of being in the presence of mind is not about kind of trying to have less thinking because again that's that's a prescription that's a doing thing it's just that somehow and do you know what I still don't know how I I still don't know exactly how this works just having that it's not about trying to have a quieter mind it's about being in the presence of mind and really starting to have faith that this um and it's a, it's a benevolent force as well. It's, it, it looks after you. It makes sure that you're always okay. What it, and we always have it. That's the thing. We've had it. We, we have access to this common sense, this clarity, this wisdom, this security, this love, this joy, this peace, this well-being. All of the time from the moment we're born and yet it gets clouded over by our thinking. But it's always there. It's just you may never have realised that it was there. From the moment we're born, we're born with mind. We're born with access to this wisdom and this common sense. And then we clutter it up with our thinking (coughs) through our lives. And it's so wonderful when you recognise the fact that it's there and it's yours to access whenever and wherever you can. It's like things will just pop up for you. And... This, for me, was a real... This was the reason why I was really attracted to this area of understanding human psychology because I remember um, one, of the, one of the practitioners in this area, a guy called George Pransky, and I signed up for a training course with him um, when I heard about these principles, and he said, like, what, what is it? What's the one thing that really appeals to you? about understanding more about these principles. And I said to him, it's, it's this thing that I keep people hearing, hearing people talk about, about innate well-being and innate mental health. It's like innate mental health. Like I've already got mental health. I'm screwing it up with a whole load of thought. But underneath all that, I have innate mental health that I've been born with. And to me, that was such a huge relief to, and I couldn't really see it yet, but the promise of it was just opened up something incredible for me at that point in time when I was, I was really starting to think, this is it, I'm going to have to cope with this stuff for life. And to understand that, but for my thinking, I had innate well-being and innate mental health was just incredible for me. I'd never even considered such a concept. And it was, and it's, it's what started me on this journey. I got a glimpse of it and I was like, that, that, I want to understand that. I want to understand how that works because I could see, I could see how that was actually going to be a really transformative understanding for the anxiety that I was feeling. One of the other stories that George tells, which, um, I love the idea of this, um, he said, Imagine you're standing at a cab stand, or taxi rank, if you're in, the, in England, and um, you're watching the cabs go by, and the cabs are kind of like you're thinking, right? So they pass one after another, after another, after another. And every now and again, one of them, maybe it's an, uh, an anxious thought, will come past, and you'll decide to jump in that cab, and you're going for the ride, right? So when you're in that cab, it's all like anxious thinking, panic attacks, staying in that cab, staying in that cab, till eventually it spits you out at the end of the journey and what George explained or certainly what I understood from the story that he explained is that when you start to get a grasp of this understanding of this human psychology and the way that human beings work is that 
you'll see less cabs. And when you do get in them, you'll get in them for a shorter journey and a shorter ride because you'll understand the way that human beings are creating their experience. And eventually, what will happen is that you won't even see the cabs. And the reason for that is... that they were never really there in the first place. You made them up. And you can see how this still gets to me now because this understanding is so profound and it has such deep implications. Can you imagine that? The cab just never even shows up. I explained at the beginning of the call that one of the things that um, I found I was doing was I was control freaking. So I was making my world smaller and smaller and smaller and I was controlling everything to make sure that I never... Um, I kind of like was controlling it so that I almost like put my hands over my eyes so that I, that I couldn't see the cabs and if the cabs came up I'd tell myself a million times they weren't cabs they were elephants and they were fine and they were fine and they were fine and if I got in one I just had to do you know I had to control it and do deep breathing and it'll all be fine so I kind of was controlling a lot of stuff around um around my anxiety and, and and controlling lots of stuff around my world as well. And then um, another big insight for me was, was the understanding that um, I, I am a total control freak. I'm, I'm the kind of person who will... Okay, I had all three of my babies on their due dates, right? <laughs> as evidence of this fact, I have planned and set goals and achieved them consistently year after year or I say consistently not always consistently but you know I set my intentions and I go after it my belief has always been that you can do be and have pretty much anything in the world you just have to decide it be so and then go out there and do what it takes to achieve it you have to push yourself outside your comfort zone to get what it is that you want and people who do that like if it's to be it's up to me and as a result of that as I said earlier, you know, I've experienced some incredible successes in my life. Maybe actually on reflection, not as a result of it, but um, one of my mentors said to me, you've achieved that despite your pushing and your striving towards your goals. And one of the insights that I experienced very recently, and I'm hoping I'm sharing this with you because I'm hoping that it opens up some more doors for you, is that... Um, that we're not in control of anything. And um, what I mean by that is that if we accept the premise that our reality is created by our thinking, and we also accept the premise that we don't choose what goes on the ticker tape. Stuff gets on the ticker tape, it's kind of absorbed from our environment and from people around us. But we don't choose what goes on that ticker tape. And so therefore, we don't choose the reality that we experience at any given point in time. When you're experiencing anxious thinking, it's not because you've chosen it. It's just on the ticker tape and it just comes up for you. And then if you also take that there's only kind of two things that can come in and change our world. One is thought, which creates our reality. And the other is that kind of voice of wisdom, which comes from mind. That doesn't come from us. It doesn't come from me, Nicola, deciding what my wisdom is. It, it comes from this greater energy. And if those two things are kind of all there is, creating what goes on in our world, and we don't decide either of those two things, do you know what? That lets us off the hook for a hell of a lot. It means that, and you know what, when I said you decide which bits of ticker tape to jump on board, we don't even decide that. 
it occurs to us to jump into a cab or not jump into a cab, but that's not our decision. That's just another bit of the ticker tape or another bit of our wisdom that's, that's saying, given your understanding of the way the world works at the moment, jump on this bit, t- bit of ticker tape, jump in this cab or don't jump in this cab. It will either occur to you to jump in the anxiety cab or not jump in the anxiety cab, but you didn't put that thought in either. And this was tremendously freeing for me because it meant that I could take my thinking even less seriously because wherever that thinking was coming from, there's another one coming along in a minute and there's another one coming along in a minute and it's not up to me to try and control what I'm going to be thinking three minutes from now. And that served to quiet my mind down, but it also, it just really let me off the hook. I'd been feeling a whole heap of responsibility about my anxious thinking and a whole load of trying to control it and trying to control the environment and the and the world around me. And I realized with, with um, A, this access to wisdom to guide me rather than thinking I could come up with some goals and strive my way towards them. And... And B, the fact that our thoughts and our um, our wisdom, they're not coming from us either. Just really let me off the hook to let the fluidity of thought, um, let my thoughts free up so they became more fluid. So the shitty thoughts just vanished as quickly as they came and they really became those neutral thoughts. Like the horrible thought, the good thought, the horrible, horrible, good, 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 horrible, horrible. No thought is either good or bad until we assign it as such yeah and because we're not even deciding because it occurs to us that is a good thought that is a bad thought the only way that kind of the way that gets determined is by our level of understanding we have about these three principles and the more understanding we have the less it occurs to us that this is a good thought and this is a bad thought. The less it occurs, just happens to occur to us, this is a cab to get into, this is a cab not to get into. The less it occurs to us, there's even a cab even there. And that's, to me, it still feels like a very magical journey that I'm on at the moment with understanding these principles because it feels like I gain an understanding and I gain a level of consciousness and I gain a uh, yeah I get I gain a more in-depth understanding and I have an insight about these three principles and then it feels like totally unrelated I just start doing things differently related to all areas of my life but related to my anxiety that I can't even really see the connection but I know because I'm listening to my mentors talking to me about this, that there is a connection between what I'm learning and what I'm understanding about the principles and what is is happening in my day-to-day life. So let me give you um, an example. Um, now, to any normal people, th- these would not feel like a big deal. But any of you who are, as I fondly call us, the crazies out there will know how big a deal this is. So... I went out for a dog walk with my kids and a friend and we went out for an hour and I came back from the dog walk and then when I went to go out again, I checked my pocket. So I checked for my phone, I checked for my, um, I was taking my leave tablet with me because one of my um, anxious thoughts is that I'm going to have a migraine and how will I cope with that and blah, blah, blah. So... So I check, have I got my phone? Have I got my micro leave? Have I got my credit card? Right, they're like my three things. I, as long as I've got those, I know that I can, I will always be safe, right? Um, because I can always get help and I can always pay to get a taxi home. Like they, they feel like they're my three, I can take my micro leave. Like I've got my three things that keep me safe. And I checked my pockets and I didn't have my micro leave tablets with me. Now, I have carried those micro leave tablets with me religiously for about the past 18 months. Right. never ever leave home without them and because they keep me safe as far as I, w- I was concerned and the kind of previously the way of thinking about it might have been if I've decided I want to go out of the house and leave my micro leave tablets at home I would make a conscious decision about it I might change the structure of my thinking about it I might try and change my thinking about the micro leave tablets I might just put them on the side and decide to feel the fear and do it anyway and go for that walk for an hour without those tablets 
But what amazed me was that I had left the house and all the time I was out of the house, I had no awareness, no thinking whatsoever about the fact that I hadn't taken them with me. And I hadn't forgotten to take them with me, right? Because that isn't something I ever forget to do, right? I check and I check and I check and I check and I check. What happened was that this understanding of the principles had meant that on a really deep level, I fundamentally understood that I had my security came from inside me. And I didn't need to carry it around with me. Like I didn't need to check that I had my security with me and I didn't need to check I had my security with me when I was out of the house. At a fundamental level, because of my understanding of the principles, I knew, I saw it, that I had my security within me without me having to think about it at all. And this, this is an amazing distinction between feeling the fear and doing it anyway and being truly, truly fearless. Like, I didn't have to think about it and then repress the thought. Like the th- It just didn't even occur to me. The cab did not even appear. Do, do you, I, I, I don't know if you can feel from what I'm explaining to you what a big deal this was. Like This is just something that doesn't happen. And then the later the same morning, a similar experience where I went out, took the kids swimming, uh, me and the kids in the car, went out, took the kids swimming, came back, and when I came to, out to, to go out again and I did my obsessive checking is I hadn't taken my phone with me. And my phone really is my security blanket because it's my, it's my come and rescue me. It's my, my line to the outside world. Like if, if I need someone to come and get me, then, then that's, you know, and I'm always thinking about who's on my phone, who's on my phone that I can think. And again, this wasn't something I decided consciously to do. It wasn't something that I thought I'm going to leave my, ho- my phone at home and see if I can do this. I just went without it didn't even occur to me to take my phone and when I and all the time I was out didn't occur to me that I needed my phone at all and these are just examples of how you don't have to manage your thinking you don't have to control your anxiety it wasn't like I went out I realized I forgot my phone and then I had to do my relaxation and my square breathing and my take a tablet and to manage that anxiety while I was out like it didn't even occur to me And that's how transformative this stuff can be because especially if your anxiety and your fear and your panic has turned you into a control freak, I want you to understand that there's a way through this that doesn't require you to feel the fear and do it anyway. It doesn't require you to manage your anxiety and it doesn't require you to control your anxiety yeah, the, 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 the anxious thinking just doesn't even occur to you. And all that's happening is a greater and a deeper understanding of these three principles. Now, I've covered a lot on this audio. I've just felt drawn to sit down and create this audio f- for anyone who is feeling as crappy as I know you can feel when when you're experiencing this stuff and I'm really hoping that the insights and the stories that I've shared with you have given you hope that it doesn't have to be the way that it is right now 